uh, a little bit further along on the Easter story uh, today. And I want to look at Luke chapter 24. We'll get there in a moment. And if it's going to take you a while, then why don't you just start filing through the Bible right now. Luke chapter 24 to help you out is in the New Testament. Over the last four months, me and my wife have been uh, living in a building site, literally. We've been having an extension. And I don't know how many people have, you've put an extension on your house before. Anyone ever done that? Okay, we've been doing that, living with three kids, one of them who's 10 months old, crawling everywhere, trying everything, and uh, we've been living amongst this building site. The idea of having an extension is amazing. Just to, you know, have extra space. Jasmine, our oldest, is going to have her own bedroom all to herself. Zach's going to have his own bedroom. It's all good. And the idea was incredible, but the actualization is kind of a little bit more challenging. We've been living amongst this building site. You can see some of the pictures uh, on the screens. And just living amongst it, you realize that there's a whole process It's not just a destination that you click your fingers to and it all happens. We've been living amongst this building site over the last four months in the reality of this inner turmoil. And we've kind of been uh, pushed back to this little uh, lounge, front lounge, which we've termed the panic room. We've been living out of there, microwave, kettle, uh, bed, Literally everything to do our whole life has been happening from the panic room called our lounge. It's been pretty extreme and at times, you know, I've been bare grills, been in the garden to try and find some, you know, uh, foliage or whatever we can have for our dinner. It's been tough times. It's just a good job she's married to a real man who knows how to do just manly things like DIY and finding food amongst the foliage. It's been very tough, but we've made it through. But thinking about that on the outside of the house from the front, you might not know much is happening. You could drive past our house and you might, you might notice 59 uh, p- vans lined up along our entire road with every trade possible. But other than that, you could look at the house, drive past and just think, this is a normal, everyday, average house on a normal, everyday, average street. You wouldn't notice much. But behind the wall, behind the exterior, there's this whole inner turmoil going on that only me, my wife and my kids have experienced. Thinking about our lives, often we can live our lives in the same way. We live with this facade that everything's good, everything's amazing, it all looks clean, all looks tidy. And yet, if you were just to go a little bit deeper into the house, you'd see the inner turmoil. You'd see some brokenness within us. Every single one of us has got some rooms of our life that experience this inner turmoil. There's not one of us that's got every room of our houses in order. There's not one of us in this room that's got every aspect of our life in perfect order. And I want to ask you the question, and maybe a challenging question tonight. What areas of your life do you have this inner turmoil going on? What areas of your life would you rather not people come and have a look at? When you invite people into your relationship and to do life with you, you'd rather just keep that door shut. Because if they were to see in that room, if they were to see some of the brokenness in your life, they might walk straight back out of the house. What areas of turmoil are behind the facade? We have this Instagram and Twitter thing going on where everybody projects the best side of their life. What we didn't see for every one amazing photo was 59 attempted photos that didn't make it to Instagram. That was the one where the oldest kid was just going absolutely nuts because they didn't want a photo taken of them. The second kid was saying, all I want is an ice cream. The third kid was running across the road and you had to rescue them. But on the 59th photo, you managed the serene, perfect picture of the idyllic family. We've all got facades to our life. We've all all can show the best side of our life. But I wonder if we can just look a little bit deeper into our lives 
And not think just about everybody else that's got obvious mess on the outside of their house. But today, look on the inside of our own homes. Look on the inside of our own houses. Could we maybe just even open the door slightly and step into maybe an area that you've pushed aside or even pushed God away from? Today, could we even venture into that room, the most challenging room, the toughest room, the panic room of your own life? In the Bible, in Luke chapter 4, and reading through all the Gospels, we get this picture of this room that on the outside looks incredible, looks amazing. If you were to look in this room in Luke chapter 24, you'd, if you were to walk in there, you'd look around the room and you'd see this room filled with incredible people. Look around the room and sat in there are the people that have been doing life with Jesus Christ himself. If you were to look around this room, you'd see disciples that have seen themselves, people healed. Even people, disciples in that room who have literally just walked past people. And even their shadow has called, caused people to have breakthrough in their own lives. You might walk into that room and be a little bit intimidated to see the closest, the nearest and dearest to Jesus. You walk in that room and think, wow, this is a house full of heroes. Walk in that room and see a house full of future church planters, church pioneers, people of breakthrough, people of the miraculous. These were mighty, mighty men and women of God packed in this room. It was the who's who of the Christian zoo. Luke 24, you'd see in that room incredible people. And yet even in this room, if you were just to look a little bit deeper, if you were to inspect the room a little bit closer, you would see just like my house at home, you'd see just like my life, you'd see just like many of your lives, there'd be rooms of turmoil. There'd be some brokenness in that room. In this room in Luke chapter 24 was real people doing incredible things through an incredible God, but living real lives with real challenges just like me and just like you. See in this room from the Gospels, we see that they were in this room, literally shut the door, locked it up because they were in fear that the Jews were gonna come after them. They knew Jesus himself had been hung on a cross, pinned with nails. They knew that they had managed to destroy, kill him. And it was just a matter of time before they worked down their hit list and they were going to get to them. So we know that in this room in Luke chapter 24, all these people have pushed the fridge up against the door. They've shut the windows down. They've made sure that nobody can get in. These disciples, these heroes, these incredible legends, these future church pioneers are locked in a room in fear. These heroes, these people that were inspired to be like, are locked in their own insecurities, locked in their own fear. They're running scared. There's a knock on the door. Some women come to the door and they say, open up the door just with the, you know, the little hook, the chain thingy on, have a look around. The women come in and they, they share this incredible news, but this news is about to divide a couple of groups. The news that these women come back to the room, back to the disciples, is that the tomb is empty. They can't believe this, this news. And one of two things happens instantly. The first thing is that Peter is gone. Like a flash, they can't even say a word. He is literally gone. He's closely followed by John. Two men decide they need to be where the action is. It's almost like these two men, Peter and John, are desperate to get close to Jesus. But within that room, there's another two men. Two men desperate to get close to Jesus. But there's another two men almost desperate to get away. Luke chapter 24, verse 13, picks a story up. The same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, 
about seven miles outside of Jerusalem. They were talking in each, with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and he walked with them. He walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? These two men stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named named Cleopas asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem? Do you not even know the things that have been happening there in these days? What things? Jesus asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, who was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all of the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. What is more, it's the third day since all of this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of our companions, they went to the tomb and they found it just as the women had said. But him, they did not see. These two men walking, discussing the events of the last few days. These people that are being close to Jesus are walking, discussing the things that had been happening over the previous years. Some of the best, incredible moments of their life. Some highlights they'd look back on and go, do you remember when? I grew up in Stratford-upon-Avon, Shakespeare country. Whenever we did a school production, we didn't do the school production in a, a, a scout hut, you know, some rundown back street. No, we did our school productions at the Royal Shakespeare Theatre. Thank you very much. I've literally performed where Shakespeare wrote all his plays, dreamt of the moment that I would stand on and deliver his incredible masterpieces. No? Okay. If you've ever done any performance, you know when when the performance is over, you've done your run, you've done your three days worth, all the parents have seen you and just been amazed by your incredible performance skills. You wake up the next morning and you realise you're never going to do that show ever again. It's like a moment of anticlimax as you wake up the next morning. Monday morning blues, you know what it's like? Some Mondays when you... You just don't want to go back to your reality. You've had the highlight of your weekend. You've been rested, relaxed. You've been in church. The power of God has hit you in a meeting. And now you've got to go back to your normal, average, everyday, mundane life. Monday morning blues. And these two men here are living right in the middle of Monday morning blues. This is the day after their Sabbath. And they're walking now with disappointment. The Bible says they had hoped. We had hoped that this man, Jesus, was the man to redeem Israel. And now the Bible tells us they are walking away from Jerusalem. They're walking away from the location that is the epicenter of the revolution that Jesus has brought about. They're walking away from what would be the hub and the pioneer sending station of the church. They're walking away from where the action is and they're walking out to a nowhere place. They're walking, turning their backs almost on everything that God has done. They're walking away in their own disappointment, disillusionment. They're walking away in hopelessness. We had hoped. And as they walk and discuss the good old days, the things that have been, the things that might have been, the things that will never come to pass, we had hoped 
They walk away, the Bible says in verse 17 of Luke 24, that they looked downcast. They were physically, the physical expression showed everything that had been going on in their hearts. Disappointment, hurt, pain had reached their heart and was now expressing itself through even their physical being. And they're on their way to this place called Emmaus. Interestingly and almost comically, this place Emmaus means warm bath. Have you ever had one of those days where you just think, I just need a warm bath. Everything will be fine. These two men are walking out to a comfortable place. Walking away from purpose. Walking away from destiny. Walking away from everything that their future represents. Walking to a nowhere insignificant place. Has disappointment ever hit you? So hard, smashed you in the face. You've almost began to speak about the good old days, the things that might have been, that could have been, and yet you've been hit so hard and now you're in hopelessness and you're walking away from purpose. You're almost walking away from destiny. You're walking away from the dreams that you once held. Disappointment is robbing you and blinding you. These two men, the Bible says, were blinded by what was right before their very eyes. Disappointment completely blinds us. These men were were blinded by disappointment. Everything, their minds darkened by the lack of light they could see in their future. Proverbs 13 verse 12 says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. The thing is, for these guys, their hope hadn't just been deferred. Their hope had been destroyed. I wonder if something's happened in your life and you feel like your hope's not just been postponed. It's been completely destroyed, completely eradicated. You could be here right now. You just feel like you're walking away from all your dreams, all of your destiny. Maybe something that happened outside of your control, a missed opportunity, something happened to you and you're walking away in disappointment and you're walking away in hopelessness just as these two men were. I think there's something about these two men that represent every single person in this room. There's areas of our life that we're disappointed and we've got no hope for. Sure, there's some areas where you're full of faith But what about the areas that you just choose to ignore? You've got no faith for them. You've got no future hope. You've got no future glasses. You've got no vision for that area. The incredible hope of Jesus approaches this situation. These two men in verse 15, the Bible says that as they were walking away from Jerusalem, Jesus walked with them. Reading this the other day, I'm just amazed by the fact that these two men walking away from promise, walking away from destiny, and Jesus walks with them away from everything that's good, everything that has hope, everything that has faith. Jesus walks with these two men. Jesus walks with our disappointment. He walks with us in our hopelessness. He walks with us in our lack of faith. I'm amazed by Jesus. So many times in the Gospels we see a God, Jesus, who interrupts. He almost performs a miraculous on the way. He was on the way somewhere and someone interrupted, he heals them. We see it with the woman with the issue of blood. The story isn't, the narrative isn't actually about the woman with the issue of blood. He's actually on his way to a greater miracle. This woman completely interrupts rudely this moment, completely steps into a moment and almost just by, oh, what was that? Jesus heals this woman. It was a miracle on the way. I'm so glad God doesn't just heal on the way, but Jesus goes out of His way. 
to these two men, Jesus was not on the way anywhere. Jesus completely took a sidetrack. Jesus went out of His way to restore these two men. This message today is called Jesus Walks, He Talks and He Restores. Jesus Walks, He Talks and He Restores. Jesus Walks with you in the, in the words of the famous philosopher, theologian and poet Kanye West. Jesus walks with me. Jesus walks with us. He walks with your heavy burdens. He walks with your disappointment. He walks with your disillusionment. He walks with you even if you're walking away from purpose, even if you're walking away from destiny. Jesus cannot just heal on the way. He will come and heal when it's out of His way. I want to say that because some of you in this room feel like you're so off Jesus' radar. You're so away from God's perfect will and His plan for your life and you feel like you're on a back corner. Jesus is not looking at you because you're not even facing Him. These two men had their backs turned, walking away from purpose, walking to nowhere. And yet Jesus saw them walking away and His heart went towards them. We heard two weeks ago about Jesus' gut-wrenching compassion. Jesus' compassion compelled him, drawed him, magnetised him towards places that maybe weren't in his calendar. If he had a PA, they wouldn't be in his priority. It would have said, oh, these people are lost. These people are gone. But Jesus said, I'm going out of my way. Oh yeah, I can heal on my way, but I wanna go towards people who have their back towards me and I'm gonna go out of my way. Matthew chapter nine, verse 12, Jesus said Himself, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but it's the sick. Luke 15, verse four, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one. Doesn't he leave the 99 and go after the lost sheep. Jesus came for the lost. Jesus came for the wandering. Jesus came for the drifters. He came for the backsliders. His compassion is compelling Him towards the darkest and worst places of your life. Jesus isn't just impressed by your faith. He's not just attracted by your faith. Jesus is compelled towards the areas you don't even acknowledge His existence. You might be here and you've never in your life acknowledged God. I wanna tell you God's heart is towards you. His heart is not towards the religious and the pious. His heart is not towards the loud and the proud. His heart is towards those who are wandering in the wrong direction. His heart is towards you today. His compassion compels Him towards you. And this great picture of Jesus and these two men walking away from promise, walking away from destiny, walking away from everything. And yet Jesus is able to walk with them, engage in conversation. And as they're talking, talking about what's been going on and Jesus is just beginning to explain some of the things that they had heard and knew full well. They'd heard Jesus Himself, although they can't see that it's Him. They've heard these things taught before. They know the Scripture. They know the promises. They know the prophecies. But even as Jesus walks, Jesus talks. He's speaking faith over them. He's speaking faith into their situation. Verse 21 and verse 23 to 23 in the story. The Bible says that they didn't recognise Him. They're saying to Him that we had hoped, but we've been severely disappointed. Even this incredibly ludicrous news came back to us. But we made our decision, we're walking away. And yet Jesus walks with them and He talks with them. Their hopelessness had blinded them from what was right before their eyes. They get to Emmaus in verse 28. says, as they approached the village, Jesus, I love this. 
Jesus acted as if he was going to go further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us. Isn't that amazing? As Jesus is walking and talking with them, the Bible tells us that he acts like he's going to keep going. Jesus is so humble, so kind, that he waits for these people to invite him in. Jesus just stays on the outskirts of your life, puts people around your life just to maybe acknowledge His existence. Maybe over the course of time, you begin to put A, B, C in together and you get this picture that maybe God does exist and maybe He is worth acknowledging. Jesus never forces Himself into anyone's life. He didn't force His way into these two men's world. He acted like he was going to continue on. Yet looking back, just, you know, giving them the, I'm going to be, you know, just just on my way. I'm just going to carry on. An invite coming. The Bible says these two men see as Jesus is almost walking away. They urge him back in. That night, they have a meal together. And Jesus stands at the door of your life waiting for an invitation to come in. Revelation 3 verse 20 says, Here I am, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I will eat with that person. All it takes is an invite into your world. Jesus makes himself plain. It's only when Jesus is in the room with the two men. The moment of revelation happens as he breaks the bread. Suddenly their eyes are open. They realise in an intimate moment, Jesus, you're real. They almost acknowledge, Jesus, you must have been walking with us the whole time. They acknowledge, Jesus, we were walking away from destiny walking away from dreams. We were despondent. We had no hope. And yet you walked with us the whole time. I want you to know whatever your destination is right now, Jesus has been walking with you the whole time. Jesus has been walking with you. In fact, He's been whispering over you. He's been speaking over your life. It's only when that moment of revelation comes that often you hear people's stories about this happened and and that happened. And someone once said this to me and it was almost like Jesus wasn't only walking with me, but He was also talking to me. These two men recognised Jesus was walking, talking with us, even in our darkest moments. In that moment of revelation, Jesus makes His exit. The Bible says in verse number 32, were our hearts not burning? As Jesus talked with us, as Jesus walked with us, were our hearts not burning? This morning did an Easter egg hunt with the kids and it's always hot, hot, colder, colder and Jasmine doesn't quite get the rules. So it's just, you know, whichever one works, just say either, it makes no difference. We'll get there. But as these guys were getting colder, 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 freezing cold, away from their destiny, the gentle voice of God was warming things up again. And they acknowledged in hindsight, were our hearts not burning within us? Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9, His word in my heart, It's like a fire shut up in my bones. A word from Jesus changes everything. Changes the climate, changes the temperature, changes the whole environment of your life. If you just invite Jesus into your world, acknowledge that He's been walking through you, 
through your good times, through your bad times, through your hurt, through your pain, in your guilt, in your shame. Acknowledge that Jesus has been whispering, whispering to you. He's been speaking, talking this whole time. Your heart begins to burn hot. Things begin to be reignited in their spirit. I love in verse 35, it says that these two men were fully restored. They went back to Jerusalem. Jesus walked, Jesus talked, and Jesus restored. They went back to Jerusalem, back to the epicenter of this new world order, back to the epicenter of this revolution that was to come. Back to the epicentre. Who's to know what these two men, Cleopas and this other guy, it's unclear who he was. But who's to know what happened through their life? Because Jesus walked with them in their disappointment. He talked to them. They invited Him into their world. And Jesus restored them. The message of Easter is a message that Jesus fully restores our life. Jesus restores every room in our life. Jesus doesn't just exist so that we can have a nice facade with a great picket fence around our life and an incredible Instagram account. Jesus exists to restore the back rooms of your world. Jesus exists to restore the darkest places in your world. Jesus exists to restore the places that you've kept locked and shut up for so long. These disciples were locked up, shut up in fear. Many of areas of our life are locked up, barricaded because of fear. Would you just acknowledge Jesus? Acknowledge He wants to walk with you even if you feel like you're walking away. Jesus is walking with you. He's whispering and He wants to fully restore your life. With every head bowed and every eye closed right now, you're here and you might call yourself a drifter or wonder. Maybe you've been walking away from God and you're just here tonight because Easter Sunday, if I'm gonna go to church any Sunday, it's gonna be Easter Sunday. You made a great decision to come to church tonight. I believe that Jesus has been walking with you. I believe that He's talking to you and I fully believe He wants to restore every area of your life. He wants you to live a whole, complete and full life. That's why not only did He die for you, but He also rose from the dead. 